You're listening to Scalay Sisters, episode number 82. Welcome to Scalay Sisters, the podcast for the classical homeschooling mama who seeks to learn and grow while she's helping her children learn and grow. Scalay Sisters is a casual conversation about topics that matter to those of us in the trenches of classical homeschooling who yearn for something more than just checking boxes and getting it all done. I'm your host, Brandi Venzel. You can find me over at afterthoughtsblog.net, spreading my Charlotte Mason joy through blog posts, study guides, audios, and more. My co-hosts today are Pam Barnhill, Abby Wall, and Misty Winkler. Pam is a speaker, podcaster, blogger at pambarnhill.com, and author of two fabulous books, Better Together and Plan Your Year. Abby is basically the queen of the Scully sistership. Abby is a country-living farmer, rancher, a loving wife, and mom of five who homeschools and reads whenever she can. Misty is a second-generation homeschooler with five kids and too many projects. With her blog, podcast, and membership, she helps you organize your attitude so you can organize your life. Find her over at simplyconvivial.com. Have you joined the Scully Sistership yet? If not, you really should, since the annual Christmas gift for Sophie Level is so close to ready that it'll probably be out by the time you listen to this. Santa's elves have been working away for months on an amazing, printable 5x5 challenge journal that is free for all of our Sophie members in December and January. Go to scullaysisters.com slash sistership to join. This episode is our annual Christmas episode. Unlike previous years, we recorded this back in October when the four of us were together. I'm so glad we did. It was such a great conversation. Using the concept of piety, as presented in the liberal arts tradition by Kevin Clark and Ravi Jane, we make holiday connections you won't want to miss. And so, without further ado, let's get to it. Let's start off with our school A every day. Pam gets to go first. You have to say, hi, I'm Pam. Hi, I'm Pam. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> um, okay, so my school A every day is a little book that I'm reading and kind of fits and starts. It's Signing Their Lives Away, The Fame and Misfortune of the Men Who Signed the Declaration of Independence. Ooh. And I got this little book at uh, the Bastion of Good Literature, Cracker Barrel. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I went out to breakfast with my husband and, uh, you know, of course, I'm shopping at Cracker Barrel because it's Cracker Barrel. Right. And... I picked up this little book and I thought, this looks really cool. But basically, it's just like maybe two or three pages about each of the signers of the Declaration of Independence and like what happened to them. Like, why were they a signer? How did they get there? And then what happened to them afterwards? And, you know, I think it's it really drives home the point over and over that these men were committing treason. Right. While they were doing this, if if America had lost the war, they would have been hanged most likely. It's really fascinating and interesting because you can just pick up and read a few and then Mm -hmm. put it back down and then later pick up and read a few again and you don't have to follow this stream of, right? you know, so I haven't picked it up in probably a month, but I will pick it up again and read a few more. So yeah, I've enjoyed it. Sounds good. I'm on a, I'm on a, uh, I was just going to say, (laughs) can tell. Like, no wonder you don't want to read one of the other biographies next time. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) All right, who would like to go next? I will. All right. uh, this is Misty. And I have The Shortest History of Europe. Okay, but I would like to point out that this is the expanded edition. It's his new updated and expanded edition. I feel like that's very ironic. Of The Shortest History of Europe. <laughs> <laughs> that means that technically the first edition is The is Shortest this, History mm-hmm. of Europe. True. It should be renamed The Second Shortest History of Europe. <laughs> <laughs> So in my five by five challenge this year, I had a history category Mm. and I chose mostly big surveys, world history. This one's just European history. And then there's modern times, of course, but they're big picture, how one age kind of goes into the next. And and that Mm. was my focus. 
I, partly I like, I like that big picture view and I wanted a bunch of these short ones like this that are that perspective, but reading several of them to see, because it's really interesting. You have to leave stuff out and emphasize certain things oh. mm -hmm. yeah. at that level. And so to read a few close mm -hmm. together, you kind yeah. of notice more of that. Yeah. So that's been a lot of fun. And this one is by John Hurst. And one of the things that made me pick this one, is he has little charts that are super simple and mm -hmm. fun. So he's trying to explain what makes Europe or the West different or what caused it to come about as a thing, like what made it a thing. He says the West is a mix of three unique people, kind of, I guess, people groups. The West is made with a combination of Greek and Roman learning, which holds that the world is simple, logical, and mathematical. So they were the first group to think that, and everything the West does is based on that mm -hmm. assumption. Then Christianity, which he says the base assumption is that the world is evil and only Christ can save. And then combine that with German warriors who believe that fighting is fun. <laughs> That's awesome. And he is he's a clever writer. So it's written very simply. He's not fancy. It's not amazing literature, but it's super clear and straightforward. And he's clever. And so I'm having a fun time reading it. This was my airplane book. And I had to read this bit that he says on feminism. So he was just saying what the transformation of German warriors into knights. And then uh, he has this kind of side note. Feminists in recent times fought against this respect of that the, the knights had to protect ladies and then that evolved into the gentlemen. Right. They did not want to be honored on a pedestal. They wanted to be equal. In their campaign for equality, they had the advantage of height. Better to start on a pedestal than ground firmly underfoot. It was because women had this degree of respect in European culture that feminism was fairly readily accepted. Mm. It is a different story in other cultures. Oh. Interesting. Oh. I just thought they had the advantage of height. <laughs> so it's been a fun read. Okay, so like I'm just going to say, like, my book list for this weekend is already this long. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> yeah. Yep. Wait, if it's not a Scully Sisters episode until you buy a book, That's I mean, right. what can we say about a retreat? If, can or I, can I buy it on if your you're phone? on a budget, you <laughs> yeah. can add a book to your wish list and buy it later. <laughs> yeah. That still counts. Yeah. So. Abby, want to go? Yes. I, I have two because I just finished um, Winston Churchill's On Painting. Oh. And it is almost like an essay, but it is very short. And then he actually has the royal, he has his paintings in the book as oh, like wow. pictures. So you got to see his art. He is kind of giving this, the reason why you should paint. And even when he was so busy, how important it was to paint because you have to focus completely on what you're doing. Mm -hmm. He also gave these wonderful stories about how it was, I think, Turner, that when he was teaching students to paint, he would start with them in the same room as what they were going to practice painting. And then after a succession of weeks, he would move them up the stories and they would have to go downstairs to look at the painting to copy it. And by the end of this, and this, he said it could be anecdotal. This is what Winston Churchill said. Yeah. But by the end of their, you know, the course, the students would be on the sixth floor. And in order to go back down and look, so he, the, he said that it is training your memory and huh. to behold and to p form those pictures in your mind. And it was such an interesting way, but he gives such a plug for Scolet. Mm. Uh, painting was his Scolet. It was well-written. It was wonderful. He's such a good writer. Yeah. And it was probably 30 pages. I mean, I, maybe. Oh, wow. It's very, very short. Everyone should read it, and you can probably get it. I mean, it's, it's almost an essay, but it was lovely. Um, I took a couple of commonplace books, um, but I started a new commonplace, so it's in my old one. So 
but it was it was just delightful. And then the next one I am reading right now is called Eloquence and the Elements of Eloquence. It's the Secrets of Perfect Turn of Phrase, and it's by mm-hmm. Mark Forsyth, the Inky Fool. It is hilarious. One of my five by five challenge categories was the liberal arts. Mm. But that's actually proven more challenging finding specific things. Yeah. But this, he just talks about rhetoric in here and why Shakespeare was such a good writer and the devices that he used. And he goes and explains them and gives great examples and how you too can learn to write or uh, interestingly and with real punch mm. and be remembered. And he has another one on entomology, and it is really, really funny as well. But the Inky Fool, Mark Forsyth. Nice. I think you should try the uh, the painting thing with picture study. Like make your kids go up, you know, like look at the picture and then go up six stories. Before they- <laughs> <laughs> before they it. Yeah, it's going to train that. <laughs> nice. <laughs> um, mine is a Jane Austen education and I can't remember the name of the author because I didn't bring the book with me here. Is it Daniel? Maybe. Der- no, or Dershowitz. Dershowitz is the last I name. Dershowitz, yeah. I'm mainly doing this as a book recommend. So this book, I read it this summer and it dawned on me because we weren't recording at that time. I don't think I ever, I don't think I ever mentioned it, but I actually really, really loved it. I bought it because Karen Glass recommended it at some point. And I thought, well, you know what? I've read a lot of Jane Austen over the years. But I don't think I've ever read anything about Jane Austen. So that would be interesting. Yeah, that's the one. Um, So it's by, oh, it is. William Dershowitz? Yep, Dershowitz. Dershowitz. William Dershowitz. I read it years ago. I loved it. I was on a big Jane Austen kid. Okay. So So it was was super good. And I think what I enjoyed about it, actually, was that it was a man writing about Mm -hmm. Jane Austen. Because usually she seems only appreciated by women and he was a serious scholar that found himself kind of humbled by Jane Austen. I think he went a little over the top a few times. Like he's now trying to fit everything into this framework of everything I needed to know I learned in kindergarten only it's I learned in Jane Austen's novels, you know, and so I felt a couple times like okay, we're stretching this a little bit. But I thought it was neat and I I guess I've always read Jane Austen for pleasure in a way that like I've never really thought about themes. Or anything. I think I've thought about like cultural things and relationships, like the relationship between father and daughter, husband and wife, courting, friendship. Like I've thought about those kinds of dynamics, but he really tried to narrow each book down to an idea or like a character sort of uh, virtue. Um, virtue sort of thing that you could draw from it and really ponder. And it was a kind of it was kind of fun. And there were a couple of my lesser favorite books of hers that I think he he made me appreciate a little more. But I was like, maybe I will go read Mansfield Park again. Like, do that's, it. That's, do that's, it. That's not, not ever been my favorite. But I thought, <laughs> you know what? I haven't. I actually haven't really read it as an adult. Like, I think mm-hmm. I was maybe 20 last time I read it. And his perspective was very interesting. And I was like, I, I need to do it again. I need to do it again with fresh eyes. And I will probably appreciate it because I find I appreciate her way more as an adult than I did as a kid. So anyway, but super good book and it was fun and it was not a hard read and it wasn't super long. Like it was just, it did feel very, I kicked off summer with that book and it was really just a nice, pleasant thing. And I had just finished reading aloud Emma to my kids for the first time. And so it was just kind of a fun way to wrap up the school year and all that. So I really liked it. Okay. We are going to transition to our topical discussion and we're talking Christmas today. Um, specifically, though, Misty was kind enough to write on the 3x5 card. Um, a thesis statement. A thesis statement. Um, kind of. It's not a kind statement. Kind of. Sorry. It's a thesis question. I was going to say, <laughs> if I were your writing teacher, this yeah. would not bode well for you. So, Misty just failed Pam's writing class. Um, <laughs> this is the question and these are the answers. Okay. So, the, the, yes. the question you we're addressing it is how does scolay and festivity fit into, what do we say? PG, PG mapped. mapped. Um, they really need to fix that. I think we should stick a little I in there and make it pig mapped. <laughs> I like it. Pig mapped. <laughs> I mean, it sounds hideous, but at least it's pronounceable. So this is the 
liberal arts acronym tradition. from liberal arts tradition. Yes. I have tried. Oh, believe me, I've tried. I don't think that there is. There's no way to remedy the situation. No. Mm. I see what they're doing and there you can't make it alliterative. I tried. Yeah. I tried. So it's pig mapped. It's the ugly truth about it's- the religion. <laughs> <laughs> PG mapped. Yes. We've been talking. So, so our last Christmas episode was on festivity and how Skolé actually boils down to festivity. Mm-hmm. That festivity is the ultimate Skolé. If, if we have Skolé that's not festive, is it Skolé? Mm-hmm. Or it's preparing you to participate in festivity, which... Peeper, we were reading In Tune with the World at that time. Mm-hmm. Peeper says is an affirmation of life, is mm-hmm. what festivity and celebration and worship is. So festivity is a word that's for Peeper tying together celebration, reception of life, and worship all together. And so in looking at the liberal arts tradition and thinking about classical education and Clark and Jane have put together this whole picture where classical education is about more than just the liberal arts and the liberal arts each themselves are about more than what we think of when we think of those words. But within this framework, which we sh- I think we should go over the acronym letters, where does Scolet fit? Where does festivity fit in the piety, gymnastic, music, arts, philosophy, theology framework? If that's the framework that everything is supposed to fit under, everything mm-hmm. that goes into education is supposed to fit that framework, where is Sco- Scolet doesn't get a letter. Well, that's true. So where does it fit? Uh, my three by five card tells me piety. It's piety. It's piety. <laughs> I feel like I cheated. Spoiler alert. Yeah. <laughs> Which is, and you said it's foundational, but you say that because in the piety chapter, they say that it's foundational. But I, I actually am wondering if it is kind of like bookends, oh. that it fits in piety and then it fits again in theology theology philosophy like because you have that very if if philosophy and theology are to lead us into truth and therefore worship yeah then it's like we've come full circle and we have both they're just in different forms because philosophy and theology are more organized and formalized and piety is more that poetic it's like the internal which we all know, if philosophy and theology don't match the inside, then you end up with problems. So I'm wondering if it's both. But I think when we're dealing with children, you know, if we're going to talk about things like festivity and Christmas and children, we're talking about the P for piety. We're not talking real as, as much about those later, not in a formal sense. So you're saying that where we are, what we're doing here and what we're doing here are the same thing, just at, in different ways. I think yeah, so. And different levels. And different levels. And probably different levels of maturity, too. Right. Like mature, like sophistication of thought and that kind of thing. So, ooh. Yeah. So, the scolé, the festivity, starts in the piety. And as you move through these, you end up at theology with a more mature scolé and festivity. Right. So because these are the, the middle parts are what you need to get there. Right. Yeah. To mature what you've started with. Right. To, to culture it. Ooh. Huh? <laughs> Interesting. I hadn't quite thought of it that way. Me either until just now. <laughs> Heard it. You Heard it first. Here first. <laughs> so, okay, so here we are in a post-COVID world where, I mean, I was just talking with someone who's, um, oh, but you, I think you too were saying this. I don't know if you want me to say this publicly, though. I, um, I'll talk about my friend. <laughs> who is not not here, named Abby. Who's, right, who is not here in this room with me, but whose Thanksgiving was canceled because of COVID and fear of COVID and that kind of thing. Um, and, and really, like, really, 
I think if everybody knew science and situation at the same time would say, well, that was ridiculous in this particular situation. But we're in an era where in the name of our idol of health, we are canceling our own culture. And I don't mean like the tearing down of statues. I mean, like we're canceling weddings and funerals and religious ceremonies of all kinds, including just your normal Sunday service at church. So I think it's interesting to be thinking about teaching our children piety in this context. What is Christmas going to look like in this context, for especially in states that seem determined to say that this is your new normal and you're just going to live in this condition indefinitely? The, one of the reasons why I brought that up, though, is because of a couple quotes on page 16 of the liberal arts tradition, the revised edition. Um, but where they, he says, first... Not that we are delighting in this in this particular context, but could it be that our delight in slaying the past might be a sign of dysfunction? And then later he says, he's quoting Richard Weaver, Ideas Have Consequences, which Misty Mm -hmm. and I read a number of years ago together, but saying that this rejection of the past, of our neighbor, of nature, may in fact be the hallmark of modernity. So I, I do think actually this idea that we are willing to sacrifice all of our valuable traditions, all of the culture that we're supposedly handing to our children in the name of our health is actually very, very modern. It's a very... It's, because it's not valid. So it's it, something we can do away with as soon as it's not... Right, right. Convenient. Like if, I don't know if you saw the Babylon Bee headline, but it was like, it was about Nero... And it says something like, Nero realizes that all he had to do was declare a pandemic to shut down the churches. (laughs) And I was like, that actually is very interesting. Like, I had never put our situation back. Like, do we really think the ancient church was going to be like, oh, you know what? Nero said there's a pandemic. So, you know, I mean, and I want to be careful. There were times during the Black Plague that the church did shut down. So I don't want to I don't want us to be ignorant of. Thing. But it's just, it's an interesting thing to think about. Anyway, so bringing this into the conversation, here we are, we're trying to nurture piety. And they're saying in this chapter on piety that piety is the respect and the duty that you owe to God and to parents and to your communal authorities, both past and present, which includes your respect for your cultural traditions, your cultural rituals. So that's kind of what I'm thinking about in this context. Well, and on... In the introduction, I think it is. But anyway, on page three, it talks about how grounded in piety, Christian classical education is the transmission of um, of the culture of the church through a faculty of friends who love the truth by cultivating virtue in the students in body, heart, and mind, and nurturing their love for wisdom and faithful service of the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. You can't have that without the piety. I mean, right. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. Piety for the ancients and for Calvin suggested a faithful devotion manifest in one's actions, Mm -hmm. piety in word and act. This devotion was not merely an emotional commitment to God or one's elders. It included the subjection of one's will and the patterns of one's life. Thomas Aquinas wrote of how piety directs us both toward God and others. As by the virtue of piety, man pays duty and worship not only to his father and the flesh, but also to all his kindred on account of their being related to his father. So by the gift of piety, he pays worship and duty not only to God, but also to all men on account of their relationship to God. And that ties back to what Pieper says about scolae and holidays. Mm-hmm. where there is no such thing as an actual secular holiday. Right. They've tried and they don't work because holidays are holy days. They are religious and they are part of this bigger picture of worship. And I think it's important with how much has been canceled mm-hmm. that basically we're out of shape for festivity. We're out of shape for social activity. We're out of practice. Yeah. Yeah. So it's just like being out of shape where things that were easy or small or normal, you have to work up to it. Like it, you get out of breath more easily. Hmm. It, what used to be normal is going to feel harder to do. And so there's that inertia to overcome that's extra 
one, there's going to be more things to consider as you set up Christmas celebrations. Mm -hmm. It is actually going to be harder. And on top of that, social interaction (laughs) is Mm -hmm. we're out of practice. And so it's going to make it, our capacity is diminished because of the lack of practice. Mm -hmm. And so I think going into it, expecting it to feel hard, you have to know why it's worth it. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm thinking also like, even if it's not hard for you, that it might be hard for a family member. There, I mean, some right. of us have family members that are afraid. Some of them have good reason to be afraid. I mean, mm-hmm. some of them are, I mean, no compromised or really old or whatever. And I mean, so so that kind of like approaching it also, if, if we're going to say piety is part of it, then being helpful to our weaker weakest links in our family, those that, you know, I mean, I think that's part of it too. So even if we walk in and say, well, I didn't really get out of practice, you know, I, mm-hmm. I was still making dinner for six people. <laughs> Every yeah. day, you know, I mean, like, it doesn't mean that everybody didn't get out of practice. Yes. But you've also talked about in the past how difficult it is. I mean, you know, we've talked about the White Witch and yeah. all the oh, issues yeah. that comes Absolutely. with mom being the one responsible mm-hmm. for Christmas and everything like that. And so you've already said before, it's not compared to making dinner That's true. That's true. It's day. not. So, Feasts yeah. are different than yeah. your daily life mm-hmm. and should be. And not only are we out of practice putting on something festive and social, we are in practice canceling things off our calendars, not doing something. So we're also in practice, some of us at least, being more involved in politics, more upset at things than we've ever been. Like those aren't really festive feelings. They're anti-festive. Right. I mean, like, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. I've been mad at my governor along with a lot of America, but (laughs) but it's true that I've been practicing being maybe worried about something, maybe upset about something. Like I'm practicing all of these more negative emotions. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to get in that place to be ready to celebrate what we're celebrating. Which is an affirmation of life. Right. Even, and I think Pieper says this, even of life as it is right now. Yeah. Hmm. And it doesn't help that even those of us who are getting to go to church are not going to church Normally, right yeah. <laughs> with yeah. a festive, so ast- right with a festive atmosphere. Yeah, you know the liturgy is even different, right? Mm-hmm. You know, and so we don't know if it'll change by Christmas time. Ugh. Not in Washington. Poor Misty. When <laughs> you're from California, <laughs> yeah, but the underground church is alive and well in California. <laughs> <laughs> All right, <laughs> I'm jealous. <laughs> I, I think most people actually have no norm, completely normal church now, except for the awful, the awful to go container communion cups. <laughs> Don't get me yeah. started. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, <I'm> sorry. <laughs> I'm like, not the communion cups again. We're not gonna talk about it. <laughs> we've, I, uh, we've ranted privately. Yeah. <laughs> I just want to clarify we do not have that at my church. Yeah. Right. Also, at mine, we are doing real bread and real wine. <laughs> okay, there we go. So. So only some of us are suffering with that miracle, terrible, terrible, (laughs) terrible invention. Now, I'm sure someone was trying to be helpful when they made it. I need to be kind. I, I have been noticing, though, as we are getting closer to Christmas time and holidays and festivity that is normal and cultural, it's more pronounced, the discontent that's going on. This summer, we hosted our church after services. Quite a few times because we were not able to meet in public, but I live in the middle of nowhere. And so no one's going to say anything, (laughs) but we hosted uh, gatherings together so that people could do it. And it was delightful when our last one was supposed to happen. It got canceled because there was so much smoke in the air and the air quality wasn't. And now with the weather, the way it is outside is not the best. Right. And so we had to cancel it. And I think that was like, a nail in the coffin because some of my most favorite positive people in Mm -hmm. church are just discouraged. And Mm. I think that piety is an antithesis of discouragement too, because we are called to endure and suffer. Like Mm -hmm. we we are called to have suffering in our lives and to bear it well and to honor God in the suffering Mm -hmm. And to call upon him for his strength. And 
And when we get into, you know, that despair and anger and angst, Mm -hmm. and even if you're not putting your, you know, your hope in a candidate or somehow, because we all know that that's folly, but still we need festivity to remind us that there is a hope in a future and paradise. Joseph Pieper in Only the Lover Sings just talks about festivities as a glimpse into the future. Mm -hmm. And when we don't have things to look forward to, like feasts and festivity, that hope and future is shoved way down. Mm -hmm. And we can't remember. And it's been so long since we've gathered together Mm -hmm. and celebrated in such a free way that we have been we took so for granted, right? Or became mm-hmm. accustomed to and mm-hmm. for granted that it's it's so we're we're bad at memory. Like we're bad yeah. at remembering those things. So when Clark and Jane talk about piety, it is not just I'm a good person. Mm-hmm. My personal holiness. Piety is this cultural, communal, social thing that we often I think don't think of or miss or think is optional. And even with Christmas, it would be pretty easy to say, even if you can't get together with other people, you can still have Christmas in your family, which is true. Mm-hmm. And a, a family is a little, a little culture and a mm-hmm. little society. Yeah. But when we say, when we just recognize what the point of it is and what it's doing, if it's pointing us to the marriage feast of the lamb, mm-hmm. that's not just going to be. Our family, our family or people just like us or, you know, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. It's an expansive yep. people. It's the church. It's the yeah. church. Yeah. 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 So your Christmas has to involve the church somehow. Amen. Yeah. So you're, what you're talking about what Clark and Jean, how they're defining all of this. I mean, they're even getting into the idea of ordering loves is part of this. So like on page 20, they say, The love of God should always take precedence over other loves. And the appropriate preference for family, church, and others should mark one's self-denial. And they they do say this proper ordering cannot be done apart from the grace of God. But one thing I was thinking about was like, for example, where scriptures say things like encourage one another daily. The grace of God, God has means through which he extends grace to us. And part of that is one believer to another. Mm -hmm. Like it's the body of Christ actually encourages each other like we put courage into each other's hearts by being together and i think a lot of the fear that we've seen among believers has been because we've been denied being together and Mm -hmm. it actually does put courage into you to meet with other people so when i when i talk with you guys there are certain things that are maybe bothering me like in the back of my head or whatever that go away they calm down like as you speak truth into my life that it like straightens out some of my own bad thinking. One of the things I was thinking about with Christmas was it is good for us to be together as an extended church family, as an extended family. And for us to be, we can encourage other people by being together and we'll be encouraged by being together. But I mean that it's this idea that our loves are, or like our loves are often ordered by truth. And that our loves are being ordered, not apart from the grace of God, but God God uses means. And his means are other persons. He often speaks to us Mm -hmm. (laughs) through other people. So the isolation is actually part of the problem for all of us. And the reason why we're troubled. The reason why school A isn't, is maybe more distant or harder. Because that is related. It's related to school A. That disorder And not being able to come back to Hmm. that centered, non-stressed, non-distracted state. It's true. We're not meant to to do all those things alone. Like we're not supposed to be the body of Christ by ourselves and just able to pull ourselves back every time we're having a problem. Hmm. Well, and um, it reminds me of, and I can't remember where it is. I think it's Lamentations, but it's like. A three-strand cord is not easily broken, right? Right. And we are called and admonished not to get in the habit of not meeting together. And even way back when, it is not good for man to be alone. I know that's a different context, but still, it's just we are meant for. um, And it strikes me that there's also the proverb, he who isolates himself 
does some self-harm. Yeah. Right. I forgot about that one. Mm-hmm. Right. How one generation can pass its culture on to the next comprised the central question of education. Mm-hmm. That's page 22. So if we are completely disrupted in our culture for the last seven months, we've had bad funerals, bad or no weddings, bad or no graduation parties, bad or, I mean, you name it, it's been bad or not existent. We think, well, education has been disrupted because all these kids across America aren't in school. But what if it's that all this kids' education has been disrupted because we dropped our entire culture and aren't passing anything on other than Netflix or something like it. Mm. And on page 17, they say, our participation in his body, the church, is thus a reality and not a mere metaphor. Or even better, it is a real metaphor. Mm. Piety shapes our being and identifies who we are. Yeah, I think there's been a, I mean, we've been struggling with identity crisis for a while now, just in our culture. In our culture. Yeah. And then when you take away identities and work and school and sports and activities, like who you are as a person, and then you are having to, you know, people brought their kids home and are face to face with children that they have not had a lot of time to parent. Um, Mm -hmm. And you are trying to navigate a stressful situation plus all these other things going on and um, without support networks, without support networks. And even if you had support networks, no one's actually seeing you face to face. Right. Zoom. Yeah. Texting. (laughs) It's not, it's not the same. And even just seeing people that you wanted to see, giving hugs. I I have seen people, grandparents say no to their grandkids and not hug them. And that uh, that's is me. heartbreaking. Right. I mean, yeah. that is, it's really hard. And that is the, the thing, but to try and design a culture that you haven't been in, like a family culture when you have a lot of space to fill is incredibly challenging. And even when just things in our normal life got canceled and we couldn't go places mm-hmm. and do things. It threw off, you know, there, there were just things that we needed to adjust even in our own, you know, homeschooled, home filled life. You know, people are like, Oh, well, you've already been doing this. So it's no big deal. And it's like, no, it did change. Yeah. It's not the same. It's right. not the same. Yep. And big part of our family, or, you know, is being Christians and they canceled Sunday schools and right. midweek Bible studies and, we youth group or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. I mean, ours started back pretty soon yeah. going, but it was still different. Well, and Pam can't sing in her choir. Yeah. No, like, yeah, you know, yeah. in your meeting, but you can't, that doesn't mean that it's normal for you. Right, right. Very much so. It's very different. Yeah. So then what does this mean for the holidays? Do, are, are you going to let, I mean, because we're the moms, right? So we have a certain amount of control. So... Are you making any adjustments and are you allowed to talk about them? (laughs) (laughs) My kids will probably not listen to this. I'm fairly (laughs) certain. (laughs) So your son, Ed, so (laughs) (laughs) So your your Christmas gift is just (laughs) going to I am not, I was, I'm not a, I, I wasn't the white witch, but. Christmas, uh, I'm not always the best at it. So I, you know, like coming up with presents, I'm not great always at Mm -hmm. that. So I have been really listening to old podcast episodes that give me really good tips on Christmas celebrations. And I am upping my Christmas game this year. I have plans for table settings and all sorts of festivities and special food. I've already created lists of our holiday favorites and meals. and. We are going to invite people over like crazy Good. and for like a two and a half week stretch. And my twins, their birthday is the day after Christmas, which mm. is always a real letdown <laughs> for them <laughs> yeah. and for us. Yeah. It's a really tough day, yeah. but we are planning something better and we are 
my husband and I, that's one of my big tasks when we get back is planning it and preparing way in advance so that we have it uh, ready to go. Because I think especially this year, we need big fun things. Mm -hmm. And, Mm -hmm. you know, maybe my church isn't going to have Christmas Eve service, which would be terrible. We're getting a new pastor, so we don't know. Right now, we have not had a pastor for almost, oh, actually, right now it's a year. What a terrible time and to have a pastor. Oh, it's been bad. Um, yeah, yeah, it's been really tough. We've had an interim pastor who's done a great job, and our elders have you know, yeah. done a good job, but it's still been yeah. really hard. Yeah. And you don't want to put your hope in a person, but <laughs> right. I'm really hoping for a Christmas Eve service or a Christmas like, Day service. So. so maybe he'll be like, oh, that's my favorite time. <laughs> if not, I'll hook you up with a place that'll okay, have one. Thank you. Guaranteed. Right. Yeah. Um, our Christmas Eve service is all has been a like my eight year old has to sit on my lap because it is so packed mm-hmm. out. So that's not happening. <laughs> <sighs> so there will be there'll have to be something, but we'll I have no idea. And I don't you know that's we as moms we can control the we can make the festivity happen at home and we can extend invitations. Yes. Mm-hmm. Right. But we need to, it's like whatever our churches are doing, that's not, that's not our control. Right. Yes. right. So we can't be complaining, trying to pester, well, <laughs> naggy. Can we or- complain about the communion cups? <laughs> I just want to know. I'm really clear. Can we or can't we? Oh, um, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> and, but whatever they are doing, like it's important to take part in it, even if it's not what it was or not what we would like it to be, not what we would have decided. However, you can still make your church a part of your Christmas. Yes. Right. Like not skipping it, like, oh, the Christmas Eve service isn't going to be as fun. So mm-hmm. we're going to opt out. Like right, we are right. so used to opting out right. that we just need to remember that the church is an important part right. of well, this. And honestly, that is teaching our kids piety also, because if it's respect right. for your elders and your, like the hierarchy of authority in our lives and our traditions, part of our tradition is respect for those who actually do have the authority over the church. And if they've made these decisions and we disagree, teaching our children to submit anyway and is actually part. teaching the, and, and take part in the way that they can mm-hmm. right. is part of their piety training. Because mm-hmm. it's not like all of us are going to 100% agree with the decisions our churches make at any time in our lives. Like, mm-hmm. it's just not going to, you know, we're all human. So I hadn't really thought about it that way. You rebuked me a little. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I'm pretty sure I would raise a stink if our Christmas Eve service was canceled. <laughs> 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 like, lobbying by email. But anyway... <laughs> But you're right. That would be um, the wrong response. So thanks for that. I'm actually giving my children the gift of time mm. this Christmas. So we're gonna we're gonna maintain the what we do for mm-hmm. Christmas. We're not changing anything. I don't know. I guess we will end up doing more because I'm giving them more of my time. So I'm actually uh, taking off work in December. Nice. Spending that extra time with them, doing more things with them. Yeah. You know, using the days between Christmas and uh, in Epiphany to like, you know, using all mm-hmm. 12 days of Christmas and doing some of the, uh, maybe some hospitality during that time and yeah. having people over and stuff. I'm not as well planned as Abby. I'm feeling like. Nobody is. <laughs> <laughs> she decides. I, feel like the like, need, I wow. need to go get my planner and get busy. Mm-hmm. But um because yeah. apparently somebody else has been thinking about this much harder than me. <laughs> well, my my word of year for 2020, hilariously, was prepare. Oh. And so I have been she really... Was a prepper? <laughs> no. No. But... Um, and have been thwarted a lot, haven't and, you? <laughs> <laughs> so I think that that also is preparing for festivity. It, you know, we think of it as just the day of, but... Just like a birthday party, it's the anticipation and the leading up to it and all of the things that go into it and re- and having realistic expectations yep. and things and understanding that things will go wrong and awry, but doing all that I can with the things that I can actually control mm-hmm. allows me to enjoy it that much more, yeah. right? Because I am not stressed and frantic, right? It is an attitude of scole in, in what I'm doing, right? It is yeah. not... 
It's not a to-do list. It is something that I'm entering into that is going to be enjoyable for all. Right. Um, it does take work, though. Darn it. Yeah. <laughs> just like just like reading hard books actually takes work, and it's hard mm-hmm. to do. It, right. But it's so enjoyable. That just makes me think of you're going to have fun whether you want to or not. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and what you can control is not the situation. Yeah. But your attitude. Yes. Yes. Right. That's oh, a good point. Oh, yeah. Somebody smart says that. <laughs> I'm, I'm currently wearing a T-shirt that tells me that I can organize my attitude. <laughs> Bonus points. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> She'll send you the check. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was thinking about this too, that, you know, I think to myself, we're not going to make any changes. Like there's no reason to make any changes. And well, we've already had COVID with some members of our family and others have been exposed multiple times and obviously aren't going to get it. So, you know, we're, we don't have those kinds of concerns the way some families may. But I was thinking about this, that like, I'm saying we're not going to change anything But I don't actually have control over everybody in my extended family. So who really knows? Like, who really knows if out-of-town people are going to be willing to drive here? It probably depends a lot on how things shake out and whether bathrooms are open for the long drives. And I mean, because there was one point where we were trying to drive down to L.A. County. It's not a very long drive. But when you're talking about, well, there's no place to pull over and stop safely, you know, if you have an emergency. Like, then you start to think, well, goodness, (laughs) maybe I don't want to make that drive or whatever. So. I was thinking as you were talking that like, I need to be determined that we are going to figure out how to make this a fun and valuable time for our children, even if like none of their cousins show up or something like that's my probably my big biggest concern is they don't really like it when they're the only kids because every day of their lives, they're the only kid. You know, I mean, like that's just a normal, that's a, that's just a normal day at home. And so they really enjoy all the extended family. And so I'm trying to think about. Not that I want to start introducing a whole bunch of new traditions, but I need to consider what are we going to do to make sure that it still feels special to them when maybe they're the only young people there. I don't know. So here's something else to consider, too. Uh, You know, yes, COVID is going on this year and it's impacted our lives greatly and it's going to have an impact on our holidays. My brother is deploying next month and he's going to be halfway around the world right so we have a lot of families out there covid notwithstanding there's something right that's going on that's going to be making their holidays different and there always is yeah well Mm -hmm. my family we buried three people so far this year yeah so i mean now some of those people weren't people that normally they were like out of state they weren't people that normally came to christmas or whatever but i mean i'm imagining how that's going to make things different for families if you've lost people so, so we're kind of, we're all sharing this one thing that we're affected right. by this, yeah, yeah. that everything is universal. Every, yeah. everyone is universally affected right. by this, but families always have. Right. There's always something. Something. Yeah. yeah. It's true. Yeah. But, and that's a good point that, I mean, I know we had to, I had to do Christmas while having a mis- miscarriage one year, but I just remember thinking my little child doesn't understand what's going on and he still needs to have Christmas no matter how. Mom, and obviously I wasn't in a life-threatening situation. I mean, you know, it was right. just depressing. And I remember my cousin, who wasn't married yet. He was a younger cousin. He's just like, why are you here and why are you okay? And I, I remember just explaining to him, my child who has no clue what's going on still needs Christmas. Right. <laughs> and so we're not going to put that on hold. I can, I can cry tomorrow, <laughs> you know, because tomorrow's not Christmas. And I can go in a room by myself. But <laughs> it's... Well, I didn't. Technically, I meant like it wasn't our family. <laughs> I'm not going to ruin this. What I meant, yes, I understand. What I meant was, I'm not going to ruin our family event. It's not going to become about me just because I'm having a really awful time. So, yeah. well, and, and that's the thing. That's the thing to remember. Christmas is not about us. Yeah, yeah. that's a good point. You know, Chris, mm-hmm. Christmas is still going to be Christmas. Your heart can grow three sizes. It's going to come. <laughs> <laughs> Because it's not about us in the first right. place. Is this when I get to bring up Dickens? Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you were going to try. <laughs> I really was reaching. Misty loves that book. Um, <laughs> That's what she wanted to say. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Parting thoughts. On page three of the liberal arts tradition, they're, they're talking about a truly integrated Christian classical education. And they say that it is formed 
within the context of a Christian life. Mm. So Christmas is family, it is life, it is part of our you know, religion and spiritual life, and it's part of our education. This is, it, it really is, it's a one piece life. It's all tied together. And so I think that helps us see the significance and that it's worth our time and effort and sacrifices mm-hmm. to do something to make it festive. Mm-hmm. Amen. Mm-hmm. Amen. God bless us, everyone. (laughs) Yes. That's it for today. And that's not just it for today. That's it for season 13. Thank you so much for listening and being a part of the sisterhood of the podcast. Make sure you are subscribed so you don't miss our upcoming season, which will be here before you know it. All of the books and things mentioned in today's episode are linked in our show notes. Just go to scolesisters.com slash SS82 to check it out. Remember to sign up for the Scully Sistership Sophie level so that you get in on our amazing Christmas gift before it disappears. Just go to scolesisters.com slash sistership to sign up. Some of you have asked about the 2021 5x5 challenge and let me just tell you, yes, it is happening. That's why the journal for the Sophies. We'll have free printable planning worksheets just like last year. Plus, inside Sistership in the 5x5 Challenge group, we also have prepared plans for those of you who don't want to make your own plan. Just go to scolesisters.com slash sistership to join us. Until then, we want to remind you once again that homeschooling is a marathon you needn't run alone. So open up your eyes and look around you. Find your sisters. I'm just gonna stop right there. <laughs>